Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we're taking a look today at the Raspberry Pi 5. This is the newest single board computer from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. They are a nonprofit, and we've been looking at these ever since I started the channel. And one of the things that I've always liked about them is that they're very low cost, but they can do quite a bit. Although over the last couple of years, their flagship device, the main Raspberry Pi computer, has been creeping up in price. And now we're at a point where they're not all that less expensive than an Intel or AMD based mini PC, which can do a lot more. So in this video, we're going to take a look at this, but also bring up some mini PCs that don't cost all that much more and see how those might compare performance wise to this one. So we've got a lot to take a look at today, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what the new Pi 5 is all about. Now the Raspberry Pi we're looking at today is their eight gigabyte model. The retail price on this is $80 for the board. You should not pay more than that. And I bought mine from PiShop.us. They are one of the official Raspberry Pi distributors. They happen to have it in stock as I was browsing around to see if anyone had any. And as you can see right now, they are once again out of stocks. So I must have gotten in at the right time. There is also right now a four gigabyte version that sells for $60, but those are the only two that I can see that are currently available. Now remember, when you buy one of these things, you're just getting the board and you still need to get other stuff to make it work. So if you start looking at the price escalation here, you're looking at another 10 bucks for a case with a cooling fan. Uh, with these new Raspberry Pis, they do run a little hotter, so you'll probably want to get that. Also, you will need at least a power supply for it. And although it uses USB-C power here and it's PD compatible, I'm finding that most USB-C power supplies do not support the five volts and five amps that this device requires. And what you're likely going to see with a regular USB-C PD power supply is a warning message that tells you that you don't have enough power to send the maximum amperage to your USB-A ports here. I also got this message with a number of large USB-C power supplies that I tried with it when I was really pushing the computer hard on some benchmarks. So I think getting the official power supply or at least one that is rated for five volts and five amps is going to be important. And you can see here, just with those two items, the case and the power supply, we're already over $100, even before we look at the SD card that we need to boot it up, and of course the HDMI cables that we need to plug it into a display. Now, if we take a look at the market right now for Intel-based mini PCs, I found this one here from Chewy for $189 that has just about everything you need to get started, including 12 gigs of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, Windows 11 built in, so the price delta here is not much more, and you get a lot here. In fact, right now on Amazon, there's a $30 coupon. It's not the highest quality PC in the world, but if you're looking to experiment with Linux or just trying to do some different things with Windows, the price difference is not significant, and you can get a computer that's ready to go out of the box versus a project here with the Raspberry Pi. And of course, this is running with a uh, less powerful processor than what you might get out of an Intel N100. So just keep that in mind. I'm thinking that uh, the Raspberry Pi is not as interesting to me as a, a computing alternative anymore due to the fact that its price is going up while all the Intel mini PCs are coming down. Now in fairness, there are still very affordable Raspberry Pis out there like the Raspberry Pi 02W. This device has Wi-Fi built in. It's a full-blown computer for 15 bucks. And there are some other options, too, that you can get up and running for even less than that. So they are still uh, definitely leading the charge on low-cost computers, but their flagship here is just getting closer to where other low-cost computers are now. Now, as far as this device is concerned, as you heard at the beginning, I did get the one with 8 gigabytes of RAM. It has a new processor on board that is significantly more powerful than the last one. This is a Broadcom BCM2712. It's a 64-bit ARM Cortex-A76 CPU with four cores, and it runs at 2.4 gigahertz. Like the prior models, you've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on here, so once you power it up and connect it to a display, you can get it on your network. 
I was not impressed with the Wi-Fi performance on this. It was about the same as the prior version. It's a one by one AC Wi-Fi radio, five gigahertz, doesn't support Wi-Fi six. It's usable, but not all that fast. But you do have some other networking options, uh, which is it's gigabit ethernet port on here. And like the prior edition, you now get full gigabit speed out of this, as you can see in the speed test that I ran earlier. So we were able to get essentially full gigabit up and down uh, using my internet speed test there. So if you were thinking about using this as a server, you do have the bandwidth to make it happen and your applications, now that you have a faster processor, should run a little bit better. Like prior versions, you've got two USB 3 ports here and two USB 2.0 ports. This is not compatible with Raspberry Pi 4 cases. So if you have a case for the 4, it's not going to fit this one. Even though things look to be in the same place, it's not the exact same. So you will need to get different cases. Now, like the prior edition, there is a PoE header here. So if you wanted to power this over Ethernet, you could do that if you purchased an additional peripheral for that. Over here, you've got two headers for attaching uh, displays or cameras. And these are different than the Pi 4's uh, camera header. So you'll need to make sure you get the right cable for that. One thing that I'm not happy about on this new one is that they're sticking with these micro HDMI connectors. So you do need to make sure you've got the right cable here for video output. This device now will support 4K60 out of both of these ports although it still feels a bit sluggish when you're running at that resolution. So I think 1080p is still the sweet spot for using this computer, but it will output at 4K60. And we'll look at the performance of its 4K output in a minute. Here is that USB Type-C port for power. I think it would be great if they could integrate video output into that USB-C port. I think it would make things a lot easier. You could attach a docking station and be off and running, but unfortunately this is for power only. Here on the bottom, you've got your SD card slot for booting it up. You can boot off of the USB also, uh, but for this video, we'll be booting it up the uh, way that they kind of assume you'll boot it up, which is off of the SD card. Now, new on this device is a PCIe uh, header here where you can attach PCI Express devices. And there are now some uh, ways that you can attach faster storage, NVMe storage, through this a header here, which we'll explore in a future video. So they have uh, given you some more I.O. options. And of course, you've got the GPIO pins up here, uh, which are kind of the staple of the Raspberry Pi ecosystem. And there's all sorts of things that you can do from a project standpoint by attaching things to these pins. And this is why this is such a popular device uh, for makers, because this is kind of a standard now, and every Raspberry Pi has these GPIO connections for attaching other devices to it. Now, one other new thing they have this year is a power switch. So you can actually turn it on and off without having to unplug power and reattach. And that switch, of course, is right here. And I'm sure there are cases that make use of that switch as well. It will boot up by default just by plugging something into it. So if you are looking to run this headless, it'll perform the same way the old one did. But now you have the option of a switch that's built in it doesn't require any extra scripts to get working. So lots of neat upgrades to this, but let's take a look now and see how this performs. Again, we're looking at this as a general computing device in this video, and we're gonna boot it up and run some general computing tasks and see how it does. Let's get to it. All right, so we've got it booted up here. We're gonna start off in 4K, although I'm going to switch it down to 1080p in a little bit because I do think it performs a lot better at the lower resolution. Now, this is the Raspbian OS, and this is the operating system that the Raspberry Pi Foundation maintains. We're gonna just load up a web browser here real quick, the Chromium browser, just to see how it performs. We're gonna go over to the nasa.gov homepage. And it's not bad, although it does feel noticeably more sluggish in the 4K resolution than it does at 1080p. So you can see some pages here do take a little while to render, especially if you've got a lot of photos coming in on screen. It's still not quite to where it needs to be as a 4K PC, even though it can output at that resolution. I'm gonna close this up real quick though and boot up a 4K test video image in VLC. This actually plays back just fine, provided you don't pull down any menus or anything. 
So this is an HEVC 10-bit file that is running at 250 megabits per second at 4K. So at least the HEVC decoding seems to work okay on this device here. But again, a lot of what you're going to experience at the higher resolution is a bit sluggish. Let's turn it down to 1080p now and see how it does. All right, so now we are running at 1080p. So let's take a look at that web page again we were just on, the nasa.gov homepage. And as you'll see here, things do spring up a little quicker now that we're at the lower resolution. The system seems to be able to handle that a little better. If I go back to this image archive, it still takes a little bit of time for things to render in, but it's not nearly as slow as it was before. By the way, we have been running on Ethernet the whole time, both at this resolution and at 4K. So not bad. Again, a little sluggish versus what you might get out of an Intel mini PC these days, but it is functional and a lot faster than the prior version. Now, YouTube playback, unfortunately, is not so great on the Pi 5 out of either browser. Here is a YouTube video from my YouTube channel playing at 4K. YouTube would only deliver me the 1080p version of that video. And as you can see here, when the Pi is set to a 4K resolution, it is pretty much unwatchable. We're dropping a lot of frames and things look very jumpy, as you can see on screen here. 1080p fares better, but it's still dropping a lot of frames. It's not as noticeable though, so I wasn't noticing frame drops as it was playing back. But as you can see there on the Stats for Nerds, we are getting very frequent frame dropping out of those videos even at the lower resolution. So here an Intel mini PC or an AMD mini PC would do a lot better. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 64.6 on the Pi 5, which is considerably better than what we saw out of the Pi 4 back in 2019. Now in fairness, the Pi 4 has seen some optimization since then, but still the Pi 5 is much faster with its new processor. However, take a look at the chart here at the Intel N100 in a Lenovo Chromebook that we looked at recently, along with the N95 that we looked at in a small uh, Windows-based mini PC. Those chips do considerably better when it comes to web browsing. Now, although you can't get Microsoft Office for the Raspberry Pi, you can get LibreOffice, which is a great open source Office suite. And we'll load up a test document here to see how everything performs. And again, this is at 1080p. It does take a little bit of time for the initial screen here to render in, but once it does, it's not bad and it's usable. Although again, I think an Intel or AMD mini PC is gonna feel a little quicker than the Pi 5 does here, even for doing simple tasks like what you see here. So again, okay, but not great. And if I was paying half this price, I'd be happy with it. But now that we're getting close to mini PC territory here, I think the performance could be a little better. Now, one of the more popular uses for the Raspberry Pi is video game emulation, and things are looking a lot better on this new Pi. Here, I've got the GameCube emulator called Dolphin running. And as you can see there on the right, we're pretty much running this game, which is Burnout 2, at full speed. We haven't been able to get uh, this level of performance out of prior editions of the Raspberry Pi. It feels a bit buggy to me. I'm getting some warning messages popping up from time to time. Uh, as you can see, the screen is flickering there a little bit, but this is pretty much the base settings here, and we're seeing really good GameCube performance, at least for games that are not all that demanding on the GameCube platform, and that was really nice to see here. A little bit earlier, I did test out some Dreamcast emulation, and that also ran quite nicely here too. So the bar is going up here on these Raspberry Pis insofar as their game emulation performance is concerned. And I think if you were looking to upgrade from a Pi 3 or 4, you'll definitely be able to do more with the 5 than you could before. Now, I was able to run the Geekbench benchmark on the Pi 5, and there I got a single core score of 784 and a multi-core score of 1,416. The Larkbox X, which I referenced at the beginning of this video with the Intel N100, though, does perform a lot better, as you can see here, especially on the multi-core side, but still a nice performance boost out of the new Pi versus what we've seen in prior iterations. So where am I at on the Raspberry Pi 5? Well, I do think it is a major improvement over the prior edition because it performs a lot better than the other one did. That was certainly evident during our game emulation tests, but also if you're using one of these for a home lab server where you're running Docker containers and that sort of thing, you've got a lot of RAM on this eight gigabyte version available to you. 
you also have a lot more performance available to you as well. And I think you can do a lot with a very power efficient package here. But if you were looking for a very inexpensive general computing device at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I think some of those Intel and AMD based mini PCs are worth looking at as an alternative because you're not gonna pay all that much more and you're going to get a lot more performance, a lot more storage, and something that is ready to go out of the box without a lot of additional accessories necessary. And of course, those mini PCs run Linux just as well as the Pi does here, and you'll have a selection of many more distributions to choose from as well. You could even run the Raspbian OS on one of those devices too. So I would look there first for general computing before here, but if you are someone who gets a lot of value out of the Raspberry Pi, if you're a maker and often making use of the connectivity options on the Pi. I think this is a major improvement if you can find one. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Budley, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Steve Green, and I'm the Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.